So while I was in office, I attended a lot of different conferences. So this conference that I went to was called La Ho'i Ho'i Ea, and it was about a year into office, and it featured various academics and PhDs that specialized in the history and legal and political world of Hawaii from before the United States was here to after. One of the presentations that stood out to me was by a man named Dr. Keanu Sai, and his presentation focused on the legal history of Hawaii and basically outlined how, according to international law, Hawaii was never legally made a part of the United States. Then naturally, this flustered me and confused me because being born and raised here, I, I mean, everything that I have been taught is that we are a part of the United States. We are that 50th star on the flag. And if they're actually, if it wasn't actually done legally, why isn't anybody talking about it? How can we be the 50th state when it never actually legally happened? So I began researching and I wondered, are there other ways that a country can become a part of another country? And I found that there's no evidence that shows that a domestic joint resolution passed by Congress can actually have jurisdiction in another country. So what the United States did was pass a domestic resolution for the United States that shouldn't have any impact beyond the borders of the United States, just like how the bills that I pass don't have an effect beyond the borders of Hawaii County. So the United States passing a resolution annexing Hawaii would be synonymous to our Hawaii County passing a bill annexing Maui or Kauai or even another country and then saying, now our laws apply to you and we get your tax money. We know that's not legally possible. I researched President Cleveland's addresses to Congress. I read the various reports to him from his investigators and the treaties between the Hawaiian Kingdom and the United States. So Article 6 of the US Constitution says, treaties shall be the supreme law of the land. And the second paragraph describes how all representatives and legislators shall be bound by oath to support this constitution. And that is where my oath comes from, to support and defend the United States Constitution. While I was doing this research, I received an email from an agency that claimed to be the Acting Council of Regency of the Hawaiian Kingdom. And within this email, there were various legal documents. And one of them included a link to the case repository of the Permanent Court of Arbitration that referred to a case titled Lance Larson versus the Hawaiian Kingdom, where the Permanent Court of Arbitration, the International Permanent Court of Arbitration, acknowledged the Hawaiian Kingdom as a state, which internationally means country. Just like the United States, Canada, or France, the Hawaiian Kingdom, same rights, same, same responsibilities. Also included in the email was a document from the UN Human Rights Office of the High Commissioner, Dr. Alfred Desaez, that was sent to circuit court judges in Hawaii. I have come to understand that the lawful political status of the Hawaiian Islands is that of a sovereign nation-state in continuity. But a nation-state that is under a strange form of occupation by the United States resulting from an illegal military occupation and fraudulent annexation. As such, international laws, the Hague and Geneva Conventions, 
require that the governance and legal matters within the occupied territory of the Hawaiian Islands must be administered by the application of the laws of the occupied state, in this case, the Hawaiian Kingdom, not the laws, not the domestic laws of the occupier, the United States. So this struck me because this is what Dr. Sai's presentation had outlined as far as the fraudulent annexation and there not being a treaty between the Hawaiian Kingdom and the United States. And it also struck me because it's talking about administering laws and as a lawmaker, that's what I do. I'm a United States lawmaker, apparently, living in the Hawaiian Kingdom, so I sought to verify the claims that Dr. Desai has made in his memorandum. I researched the Hague and Geneva Conventions and I discovered that these are treaties, many of which the United States is a part of. I also found Title 18 of United States Code, Section 2441, that specifies any violation of these treaties constitute a war crime. And again, Article 6 of the U.S. Constitution, where my oath comes from, says that treaties shall be the supreme law of the land. And again, Title 18 says a war crime is any violation of these treaties. And the articles I believe that Dr. Desais is referring to is Article 43 of the Hague Convention, and Article 64 of the Geneva Convention. And both of these describe how the penal laws of the occupied territory shall remain in force, which means we should be following Hawaiian Kingdom law, not United States law, if in fact the Hawaiian Kingdom is occupied. I read academic publications and research um, much of which was authored by Dr. Keanu Sai. It took me probably 30 minutes to an hour of each page because they're so dense and the concepts, the legal concepts, I had a law dictionary right next to me and I was constantly having to research and verify different aspects of the history that he was referring to. And I began to take it more and more seriously and it became a question to me if in my capacity as a lawmaker if I could be liable for violating international law and be liable for what United States law refers to as war crimes. So I decided to hire an attorney to help me draft a letter to my county attorney. And I hired an attorney because I wanted to make sure that my question that I posed would be properly addressed and receive proper consideration and that I was able to articulate all of my concerns and the evidence in a way that would require him to address them. So I worked with my attorney and I drafted a letter. It was about 11 pages with almost 400 pages of attachments to our corporation counsel, also known as our county attorney and I brought it to our first meeting in which I made my, in which all, I put all of this together and I started, started to be concerned. And I announced that I would be refraining from voting until the county attorney could assure me that I would not be incurring criminal liability for violating international law. We all received an email uh, in June from the Acting Council of Regency they informed us of I, I, three I, important actions. Right, but so what is your position? My position is that I will be refraining from participating in legislating until Mr. Kamala Mella can assure me that I'm not incurring criminal liability under international law and federal law. Okay, well then, that being the case, this is only my opinion. She cannot vote yes or no, and I mean, I would urge you to just ignore that, quite frankly. But that being the case, if you're going to take the position that you're going to wait for something from Mr. Camilla Mella, something formal, you shouldn't even be participating in the past. It's, it's I, you can't even sit here. 
the rule of law also provides the opportunity for the politics to be exposed. Right? Um, when, you, when you understand the rules and when you understand the law and the procedure, it's easy for you to identify when people start to walk out, walk away from those procedures. It's easy for you to identify that, that a particular person is strapped with a certain kind of politics, right, which is not going to allow them to follow the, the rule at this particular point. Inasmuch as Ms. Ruggles has retained uh, services of her private attorney, which, whose opinions are contrary to what you had told us verbally yesterday, I would say don't put anything in writing. I don't want to, you know, think uh, poorly of Ms. Ruggles, but I think this is, it's not out of the realm of possibilities that they're trying to set up your office. I would say just stay out of it. Let her make the first move. She's got to make that move. The takeaway from uh, yesterday's meeting is twofold. Uh, one, um, wh whatever response that I'm going to give her would be uh, what was discussed here. So it's uh, so it's, it's going to be ra rather limited. The next morning, the county attorney sent me an email in which he gave me one and a half sentences in his response. He said, he said, in response to your inquiry, we opine that you will not incur any criminal liability under federal or international law. And then in parentheses, he said, see Article 6, international law cannot violate federal law. That's all he said. Um, and Article 6, what's interesting about that is Article 6 is exactly where my concern was coming from because that's the article that says treaties are the supreme law of the land and that's where my oath of office comes from and i went to article six and nowhere does it say federal law cannot violate international law my attorney cannot even make sense of that he says article six doesn't say that furthermore i wanted him to assure me the legal definition of assure is to put certain beyond all doubt and the county attorney did not put certain beyond all doubt that I would not be incurring criminal liability for violating international law. It was a conclusionary statement unsupported by any facts and analysis. Furthermore, he has given me opinions in the past that were comprehensive. They included case law, facts and analysis. I was expecting him to show me how Hawaii is actually legally a part of the United States. I was expecting him to dispute that the Hague and Geneva Conventions actually apply and outline how I wouldn't be incurring criminal liability. Instead, it appears he dismissed the whole, all of the evidence that I had and just issued this blanket statement, half of which isn't substantiated in the article that he refers to. So I actually wanted to continue to attend the council meetings and just abstain from voting until Corporation Council could assure me that I wouldn't be incurring criminal liability for voting. Ms. Ruggles is not going to reconsider her position and she's going to wait for a formal opinion from Mr. Camilla Miller. And as a member of this body, I got to ask her, I'm going to, I'm going to object to her being and I really don't want to take that position because I've asked you several times, please just reconsider your position. If that's the case, she should not even be sitting. Well, thank you, Mr. John. Um, thank you, Mr. Camelano. So, Ms. Ruggles, uh, our rules do not allow us to defer a decision. We either have to vote yes or no, no abstention allowed. Uh, given that situation, as a personal courtesy, we can excuse you from council chambers until pending you are comfortable in moving forward. Is that what, is that your wish? If that is my only option, then that's, that's my only course of action to take. So I will be excusing myself until I receive a response from Mr. Kanamadana. Okay. Thank you very much, Ms. Ruggles. Uh, so for the record, she'll be excused. So we have under the council rules, the chair of the council at the time 
council member Valerie Poindexter had to approve of my reason for abstaining, in which she denied my ability to abstain. And she said that if I was going to be present, silence would be considered a yes vote. So my only option was to not attend the meetings. I was surprised at the response by the other council members as they were also very dismissive. We had all received that email from the Acting Council of Regency and the documents within that email were from legitimate authorities. The UN Human Rights Office, the High Commissioner, the Permanent Court of Arbitration. I was surprised that none of the council members even wanted to hold Corporation Council accountable for providing me an actual proper legal memorandum and that the evidence that I had provided didn't even substantiate the discussion of having a discussion about it, that they're not even curious to see what he has to say about what the Human Rights High Commissioner said about there being a fraudulent annexation, an illegal occupation. The fact that they didn't even, they weren't even curious at all what our legal justification was for just ignoring that. How are we still upholding our oaths of office in this situation when Article 6 says treaties are the supreme law of the land and in 1893, President Cleveland stated that the act stated that the United States had committed an act of war against the Hawaiian Kingdom in 1893. How, how are we not still in a time of war when no treaty of peace has been reached? Finally, since she has chosen voluntarily to leave this board and is questioning the legitimacy of this board and the County of Hawaii, the State of Hawaii, and the United States of America, I'm going to have to ask the chairperson to at least consider, I'm going to have to do it, withhold her pay. So instead of focusing on a dialogue about the law and the facts, the media and the other council members focused on how I wasn't doing my job by not attending meetings and my salary how my district no longer had representation and I was being negligent in my duties and that I should resign and pay back all of my salary instead of focusing on the fact that Corporation Council did not assure me that the United States isn't actually occupying Hawaii right now. The media framed my action to be as if I was associated with some sovereignty group. And a lot of the times they said that. In fact, Corporation Counsel, the county attorney, said that himself before he had even read my letter. When I told him that I had sent in the letter and that I would be refraining from voting, he said, oh, it seems Ms. Ruggles is associated with some sovereignty movement or some sovereignty group. Um, and I'm not, and I have never been. I've heard what uh, council member Ruggles had uh, talked about and and then I'm just over this time that I'm hearing that she needed a formal or opinion but uh, a lot of these claims is coming from uh, Hawaiian sovereignty groups. They were also alluding to me being a punitic. They're making it about my father and I was still in my office every single day serving as the liaison between my constituents and the departments because really the legislating is a very small part of our jobs as council members. We get, I mean, my office got calls every day, 20 calls a day, 20 emails on various issues, none of which have anything to do with lawmaking. They more have to do with small infrastructure issues or issues that they're having with law enforcement, the roads, parks, water spigots not working, 
complaints that they have with different departments. And so I served as a liaison, and I continued to serve as a liaison for my constituents between the departments for various issues that had nothing to do with international law or war crimes. And many of my constituents experienced that, that I was still there for them in many ways, even if I wasn't voting on legislation. I think that the type of dialogue that we could have had would have been one of presenting different facts. I would imagine we would need to get the state attorney general involved all the way up to the Department of Justice. I wanted to see what they had to say about the UN Human Rights Memorandum. What, what is the Office of the High Commissioner of the United Nations Human Rights Office missing? If he's claiming that there was a fraudulent annexation and there's an illegal occupation and we need to be administering the laws of the Hawaiian Kingdom, what does the United States have to say to this? Keanu has an interesting uh, way of explaining this. He, he often describes himself as a conservative radical, right? Or, 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 or something along those lines. Like, if you think what Keanu is ultimately asking for, what he's asking the world to do, what he's asking the international community to do, is not that radical at all. Right? It's very conservative. He's asking them to comply with the law. Not make new law, to comply with the existing law. To comply. Hawaii's occupied. Please enforce the laws of occupation. Right? Like, all he's really saying at its core, follow the law, please. And the list of people who have followed the law and then got hammered for complying is long. Lance Larson, following Hawaiian Kingdom law, no law for license plates, removes the license plates, gets arrested, gets 30 days in jail, seven days solitary confinement for quote unquote complying with Hawaiian Kingdom law. Right? Jen Ruggles, complying with the law, following American law, citing American law, saying American law compels me to take this action. I take this action and ask for an answer and I get character assassination. I get people attacking my character, not answering the question. Um, ask for legal representation, right? Ask the United States or the corporate council, right, of um, Hawaii County um, to provide a response, right? What is the status of, of, of Hawaii? Um, and just, just the fact that we're starting to see public officials, right, um, representatives who, who hold um, um, seats, um, public servant seats within the state of Hawaii, start to ask these questions, um, um, kind of lets you know that we're in some different times here. This history of Hawaii as an illegally occupied, um, albeit internationally recognized sovereign state, of course collides with the narrative that the state of Hawaii government usually puts out there. Ruggles is one who has not dismissed it. She's really taken it seriously and then done her homework as far as following up on what is the actual meaning and what are the implications of this history. Because um, history is how we got here. And the interesting thing about her is that she's looked through the framework of her oath of public office that is where she's found the potential criminal liability that she may have incurred uh, because and it's, it's interesting because never mind all of the Hawaiian history, never mind uh, what the kingdom would have said about this, it's just right there in state and county government. There is a violation of the constitution which incorporates some um, international treaties including treaties with the Hawaiian kingdom. Article 29 of the Geneva Convention specifies what an agent is. 
And according to Article 29, an agent would include a civil servant. And so according to the Geneva Convention, as a civil servant, as an elected official for the United States, that means that I am an agent for the United States. And the Hague and Geneva Conventions outline what my responsibilities are. So my role shifted from being a legislator for the United States to being an agent of the United States under the United States signed treaties, the Hague and Geneva Conventions. So I began to put every other agent and every other agency of the United States in Hawaii on notice for what appears to be violations of the Hague Geneva Conventions and rights of protected persons being violated. And I started with Queen's Hospital. In this case, Queen Emma had established free healthcare for Aboriginal Hawaiians. And this was a right afforded to all Aboriginal Hawaiians in Hawaii to receive free health care. And when the United States came and overthrew the government, they manipulated the charter so that Aboriginal Hawaiians would now have to pay. And this is a direct violation of Article 50 of the Hague Convention. So I sent a letter explaining everything to Queen's Hospital. Jennifer also pointed out to the good folks at Queen's that Hawaiians should be treated free of charge because that's in the founding charter. <laughs> All of this was removed after the overthrow. I sent letters to all circuit court judges concerning foreclosure proceedings in Hawaii regarding the rights of protected persons. Article 46 of the Hague Convention and Article 47 specifically prohibit pillaging and confiscation of property from protected persons. I sent a letter to every department regarding taxation in Hawaii regarding pillaging. I sent a letter to President Trump and Majority Speaker of the Senate, Mitch McConnell, and Speaker of the House, Paul Ryan, regarding unlawful and wanton appropriation of property in Hawaii, which appeared to be in violation of Article 43 of the Hague Convention and 147 of the Geneva Convention, and how many trillions of dollars have gone and left and have been taken from the Hawaiian Kingdom. I sent letters to the Supreme Court judges in Hawaii regarding extensive destruction of property on Mauna Kea, and I cited several articles of the Hague Geneva Conventions that apply, and actually other international laws. Destruction of a public monument, the face of the destruction of burial grounds, cultural sites, religious sites, the face of the destruction of an object held in veneration by such We have to just say one thing is to let everybody know, all of you, we have nothing against you. But because there is no treaty of annexation, we are under illegal occupation. And by exercising the laws and actions of the illegal occupier, all of you could be held accountable yeah. for war crimes. And as long as we said that, now you cannot say you never know. And all we're trying to do is protect you as much as to protect our, us. But. If you're going to commit that action, then you're going to be held accountable, and we're sorry. Mahalo. If you look into the recent actions taking place with the court case with the Molokai fishermen, educate yourselves and you will see what we are talking about. And it's a, there's a connection to the Molokai fishermen's case recently on Maui, when the court essentially took judicial notice as a result of our expert witness testimony, Dr. Keanu Sai, as well as his legal brief concerning, concerning the continuity of the Hawaiian Kingdom and the legitimacy of the acting government. Respectfully, uh, the court is of the view that the, uh, based on everything that's been presented, that the court does have subject matter jurisdiction. And thank you. I would ask because we did make the request and it's provided for in the motion itself as well as the authorities that the court take judicial notice of the matters that were presented 
uh, in the motion itself. What's the prosecution's position? All right, then the court will take, uh, there being no objection, the court will take judicial notice as requested in writing on the uh, documents. That judicial notice taken by the courts essentially affirmed what we've been saying for so long, that the Hawaiian Kingdom continues to exist with the attributes of a state sovereign nature. And because the Hawaiian Kingdom continues to exist, the state of Hawaii, their judicial system, all of this really is a continued illegal act. And um, that awareness is growing. During the time that I had refrained from voting and began to understand and act on my duty as an agent for the United States, the National Education Association came out with three articles. And the National Education Association for the United States is America's largest labor union of educators. The HSTA, Hawaii Teachers Association, is the Hawaii affiliate chapter. And as a whole, the NEA has over 3 million members. And they published three articles describing the illegal occupation of the United States in the Hawaiian Kingdom. I mean, America's main educational association is saying that according to the facts and the law, the Hawaiian Kingdom is being illegally occupied right now. Hope that when a people are singled out for destruction because of their heritage and religious faith, and we can do something about it, the world will not look the other way. The very idea that individuals hold obligations under international law was long recognized before World War II. But typically, only states could be held accountable for violations committed by their agents. The Nuremberg judgment marked a tipping point. It affirmed the capacity of individuals to commit crimes and most fundamentally, the distinction between the responsibility of states and the responsibility of individuals. Had Ihnen Hitler ausdrücklich verboten? It held that crimes against international law are committed by men not by abstract entities, and that only by punishing individuals who commit such crimes can the provisions of international law be enforced. The principle of individual criminal responsibility has particular importance in mass atrocity contexts. It seeks to prevent formal assignment of blame or guilt to collectivities such as entire nations, societies, or whole ethnic and religious groups. This rationale was in particular invoked by the Yugoslavia Tribunal. It treated international criminal justice as an instrument to mitigate feelings of resentment, hatred and frustration. It will clearly be much more costly and dangerous to stop later than this effort to prevent it from going further now. The stark reality was that these courts would be the international community's frontal assault on impunity and often had to begin their work amidst ongoing atrocities.